start things off uh, in my capacity as the president of the New York Society for General Semantics and uh, welcome you all to our first event of the new season. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, the New York Society for General Semantics um, uh, has been around for uh, close to three quarters of a century. Is that, uh, no, more than that, right? We've about 76. No. 46, I think. Still. We started in 1946. Yes. Um, I, I like all those wows, yeah. And, uh, and here we are. Um, and we're also closely connected to the Institute of general semantics, um, which has been around since 38, uh, 1938, and uh, if you <laughs> if you are registered with the New York Society on on our website, um, which you are if you've come to this event um, and registered for it, um, then you'll get updates, and and you'll also find on on the site uh, many resources and. Uh, and videos, including the one we're taking tonight, where we, uh, we share those. Um, and uh, also uh, links to the um, Institute of General Semantics, and we're a proud co-sponsor of the annual Alfred Korzybski Memorial Lecture, um, which will be taking place at the Princeton Club, a bit further uptown in, in Midtown, um, so the 28th of October? Like 27th, oh, 28th, 20. and 29th. Well, the October 27th, um, in uh, the evening of October 27th, is a dinner, and the lecture will be given by Terry Moran. Um, some of you who are familiar with media ecology coming out of New York University may know, may have heard the name Terry Moran, may even have know who he is, or even had a class with him. Uh, I'm very, very pleased that he's this year's uh, Korzybski lecturer. He'll be speaking about propaganda and political <laughs> communication, a topic that we've also uh, has come up in a few of our sessions here last year. Um, for some reason, there seems to be a lot of interest in it recently. <laughs> <sighs> um, and that will be followed by a two-day uh, symposium uh, at the Princeton Club um, where uh, number of people will be taking part, I'll be, and uh, uh, some of you, you here uh, you as well. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, our next event after this one will be on Wednesday, October 4th. Um, and I'm finalizing it, but um, I think we're, we're going to have something really cool for, for that event. Um, I, I'm hoping that uh, in tentative plans to have uh, someone who is a mentalist come and give a talk about that. Um, uh, well, uh, folks who are at, at the NYU Media Ecology program know the name Moshe Botwinnik, um, but more the, the stage name Mark Salem is better known. Uh, uh, he's an old friend and, and like a number of us, a student of Neil Postman's. Um, and with that, I'm going to now turn over the reins of, uh, for, for this evening uh, to my friend, uh, co-conspirator, um, and fellow uh, trustee of the Institute of General Semantics, uh, Tom Gencarelli. And Tom uh, is, uh, like, like myself, a graduate of the old NYU Media Ecology program uh, that was started by Neil Postman and Terry Moran, um, and with Chris Nystrom uh, joining them soon after. Uh, Tom is the chair and professor of communication at Manhattan College, and uh, very appropriate for general semantics, Manhattan College is, of course, uh, located yeah. in the Bronx, yeah. uh, which shows that, as we like to say, the map is not the territory. Uh, <laughs> you just thought it out right Just right now, yeah. Um, so uh, I'll let Tom take over now. Sure. And uh, I'll sit down. Inter interesting. A little bit of musical chair, so Lance is introducing me so that I can 
Could Go you ahead speak and... up, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. <laughs> um, Lance introduces me so that I can introduce him. Um, first off, I'll point out um, I I have his book, and my book is signed, and you too can get your book signed <laughs> if you. Uh, they're available here, and he $40. will sign it for you tonight for forty for forty dollars. But. Again, you get it signed by the man in person, and so, you know. Which is a substantial discount from the list price. Yes. Or you could have a rare, unautographed copy. <laughs> That's true, too. Yeah, I mean, you could buy it on Amazon later, and if you're a prime customer, you can get it in two days. And there's all that, but. And I'm willing to sign someone else's name, or. <laughs> and probably other people will be willing to sign my name, or someone else's name. I charge. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so reintroducing Lance. Um, it was in his 1974 Alfred Krasivsky Memorial Lecture entitled Media Ecology Colon General Semantics in the Third Millennium that Neil Postman uttered his memorable statement, or maybe notorious statement, depending upon who you speak to around these parts. Uh, and I quote Media ecology is general semantics writ large. Now, by this statement, Neil meant the following. If, and, and I'm quoting him here, if general semantics deals with people's reactions to neuro-linguistic environments as environment, and Kozievsky was uh, thus the founder of linguistic ecology, media ecology constitutes our attempt to expand the notion of a semantic environment beyond our human language. Language, of course, being our primary medium of communication with regard to meaning, the making of meaning, and all of the things we consider meaningful. Uh, it, it constitutes our attempt to expand this to consider the semantic environment of all of our media of human communication. Now, this includes how these additional environments impact language itself, and thus Kruszewski's pro project. Um, in addition, while, while Postman in his lecture made note of the fact that Korzybski never differentiated between our spoken and written form uh, of language, which is something I, I've actually written about a bit. Postman's media ecology is, though, rooted in the very understanding of our human language, particularly in its print literate form. Everything comes back to the need to conserve and preserve literacy uh, in what, during Postman's career, was the, were the dawning days of what many now argue uh, is, is our post literate age. Allow me to point out, too, that quite a number of New Yorkers, some of whom are in this room, were introduced to Korzybski and general semantics by Neil Postman and Christine Nystrom as part of their studies in the Media Ecology program, uh, master's and doctoral at New York University <coughs> from the early 1970s and, and through the earliest years of this century. Um, yes, it, it's true that many a born and raised New Yorker interested in communication and media studies pursued his or her graduate education at NYU in part because, well, we just didn't want to leave. Um, <laughs> and that many of these people have gone on to build and sustain academic careers at many of the other institutions of higher ed here in the greater New York metropolitan area. Yes, we do need to get out more. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and by the way, I, I'm thinking of such prolific and, and high-profile scholars as uh, Paul Levinson, author of, among his many books, Digital McLuhan and uh, New New Media, uh, and also Jay Rosen, author of uh, What Are Journalists For? and his influential blog, Press Think. And then there is Lance Strait. Lance has done more than anyone to advance the cause that is media ecology after Neil and, of course, after Marshall McLuhan and all of the others. Well, Levinson tends to be a celebrant of all new, new media, and, and Rosen studiously avoids mentioning media ecology. His faculty page uh, on the NYU website says that he has a PhD in media studies. <laughs> 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 Lance has picked up the mantle, and he has held it higher than any of us. And if an intellectual history is told as much in important thinkers as in their ideas, in, in the knower as much as the known, Lance has become the standard bearer. He's committed himself to this cause in ways that ensure that the name media ecology 
and the conceptual and philosophical framework known as media ecology will live to see another and another day, a gift to a future we will not see. In doing so, uh, however, he's also taken on the task that is furthering the cause. The, the two existing uh, primers of media ecology, to my mind, are, are Neil's teaching as a conserving activity and Christine Nystrom's PhD dissertation at NYU entitled Toward a Science of Media Ecology, colon, The Formulation of Integrated Conceptual Paradigms for the Study of Human Communication Systems. But expanding and improving our learning and knowledge and moving it forward into the future is what we as scholars and as intellectuals do. Like Torah and Talmud, the project and the conversation are never finished. Thus, in Lance's case and in the case of his new book, um, which is obviously the subject of tonight's presentation, the mission he has chosen to accept is to grow media ecology as a field that is more than just a branch of media studies, more than just a special interest among and, and for people interested in media and communication. It is, to use the words of Douglas Adams, which Lance himself borrows, to establish for us incontrovertibly that media ecology is foundational to understanding life, the universe, and everything. Now in saying all of this and on this occasion of uh, this fall's first New York Society of General Semantics event, I should also remind you all of the following. Lance himself has already introduced our proceedings by noting that he is the current president of the NYSGS. He is also a member of the Board of Trustees of the Institute of General Semantics and from 2008 to 2011 served as the IGS Executive Director. In addition, he is also one of our foremost scholars on the subject of general semantics, having edited with IGS Vice President Corey Anton the anthology Korzybski and... Talk, talk, talk. Uh -huh. That's the whole title, right? Uh, and also having authored on the binding biases of time and other essays on general semantics and media ecology. And also having published uh, numerous scholarly articles on the subject and presented countless papers and talks on the subject. Here then, and you know this, to, to read some selections from his important new book, Media Ecology, colon, An Introduction to Understanding the Human Condition, which is to say, to tell you about life, the universe, and everything, uh, I reintroduce to you all my good friend, Lance Street. Are you good from memory, or do you actually have to? Yeah, I, uh, no, I'm <laughs> not quite, but. Uh, well, okay. I hope we also have a chance to have some conversation and Absolutely. all that. But uh, thank you for the introduction. It's, uh, uh, of course, uh, hard to live up to, but uh, you know, get paid for flattery. Um, well, huh? Yeah. Just yeah. Uh, well, I, I thought I would just start by reading a little bit of the beginning of the book. Um, and uh, I mean, I find it hard to get started, and uh, I sometimes feel like the first sentence is 50% of what I'm going to write, um, and then the second sentence is, is another 25%, um, and, it, and it's, uh, as they say in math, asymptotic from that point on. Um, and uh, so this was the first sentence that I wrote, um, and I'll go on from there. Uh, this is the preface, the first word. I, I have no choice but to begin any discussion of media ecology by plunging in medias res into the midst of things, and perhaps that is entirely appropriate. After all, we experience life itself in this fashion. Awareness coming long after we are born, let alone conceived, our beginning shrouded in mystery, as is our ultimate end. Evolution itself is nothing more than a game of monkey in the middle. You could laugh on that one. <laughs> Certainly as far as our species is concerned. As for the universe, 
Physicists may tell us that it began with a big bang and will end with an entropic heat death, but scientific theories are by their very nature tentative, never final. Knowledge of any kind is nothing more than a work in progress. And even if physics has it right, there's still the question of what was there before the Big Bang and what will there be after the final descent into chaos? The human condition is a middle ground, an environment that constitutes the medium of our being and becoming. We emerge individually and collectively out of those same gaps and cracks that, as Leonard Cohen observed, allow the light to get in the interstices and intervals, the stuff that lies in between the manifestation of an ongoing process of mediating that surrounds and pervades. The inescapable fact of being stuck in the middle with you, as the song by Steeler, Steeler's Wheel laments, also applies to the writing of books, something I was painfully aware of as I worked on this book. It may seem otherwise because the written word promotes an extreme emphasis on linearity, on sequence, continuity, progression, and more basically, an external visual geometric arrangement that we in turn internalize. Letter follows letter, or in the case of non-alphabetic scripts, character follows character, word follows word, sentence follows sentence, paragraph follows paragraph, page follows page. The L-I-N-E line is drawn and quartered, given rise to a rectilinearity based on the right angles of rows and columns. The grid locked into our consciousness, the rectangular page becoming the model and meta pattern through which we frame our experience. The storyline becomes the structure of our narratives. The line of argument becomes the logic by which we organize our discourse. The line of thought becomes the standard for coherent cognition. The line of sight becomes the basis of modes of perception dominated by vision, ultimately putting our world into perspective. Everywhere we look, we find objects surrounded by straight lines and right angles but we find ourselves surrounded by straight lines and right angles in the objects that surround us, the sheets and screens, gadgets and furniture, rooms and buildings, architecture and thoroughfares. We have created our humanly constructed environment in the image of the line, a form that is really found in our biophysical environment with its rough irregular textures and outlines and the general curvature of space. The contrast between orality and literacy is a contrast in form between ovality and linearity in which the cyclical nature of time yields to the arrow of chronology and the myths and legends of oral tradition repeated endlessly in infinite variation yields to the fixity of written historical narrative. At the start of the 20th century, Albert Hubbard stated that Life is just one damn thing after another. A quote later adapted by Arnold Toynbee to refer to history, a view that stands in contrast to non-Western and pre-modern understandings of resurrection and reincarnation, sacred time and the eternal return to an Edenic golden age. The shift is re reflected in the changing sense of the term original which once referred solely to the past, to beginnings, to the earliest in the archetypal, to aborigine, but has come to refer to the novelty, to the newest, most unprecedented. The stress on the modern sense of originality is connected to the introduction of typography, the printed book, seemingly complete in and of itself, obscuring the intertextuality of all forms of composition. As Walter Ong explains, print gives rise to a sense of closure as opposed to the openness of scribal copying, a process which through the written work changes from one copy to another, alterations being introduced both by intention and by mistake. But print leaves us with the impression that the subject addressed between the covers of the book is in fact fully covered 
singularly authored, and utterly original, and altogether complete. Typographic fixity turns the work into a closed system that intensifies the illusion that there is a true beginning, middle, and end. Against this form of print bias, I want to stress that this book, like all books, not only begins in medias res, but is the product of a process of mediating between myself as a writer and you as reader, certainly but also between myself and many others who have influenced me through the spoken and written word. Mm -hmm. At this point, I go on with acknowledgments. Well, I thought maybe we'd go back and forth a bit. Sure, or do you sure. Mean? Yeah, I wasn't sure if I should ask questions first. And yeah. yeah uh, well, you're I mean, in charge. Okay, the, the, the most important question, and obviously we'll save time for all of your questions too, uh, even though most of you haven't read the book because you don't own one yet. Um, um, the, the question I guess I would start from, and I, and I start from it because I know a little bit of the story, what was the impetus to write this book, having read your other work, uh, having recently uh, and, and unfortunately belatedly written a review of Amazing Ourselves to Death, which was published in 2014, also out there and available to you, what was the impetus to write a book in, where in, on the cover in block letters it says Media Ecology? Well, I had, um, I had some free time, and <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you had lots of things you could have written. <laughs> no, uh, serious question. Well, I mean, we could go back to being graduate students, and uh, you know, I thought coming into study media ecology, I thought that it must be a fairly established kind of thing, and then I could just draw on it and look at things using it, um, and. Uh, learned that actually it wasn't, um, and that uh, to do my dissertation, which took a, a very long time to do, I, I actually had to um, work on not just the topic, which, which was heroes, um, but also what media ecology actually is. So that sort of started it off, and, uh, and you know, we, uh, together, we later formed the Media Ecology Association, and this seemed yeah, I mean, in one sense, at the time, this was a book that needed to be written, um, uh, and uh, it uh, over well about uh, so over twenty years ago, I said I was going to write a book called Understanding Media Ecology, and uh, you know I wrote a proposal for it, um, and this was going to be in, in the um, old Hampton Press. Uh, book media ecology book series that I had started up, um, and uh, you know, like I noodled around with it, but somehow other things came up. Other things came up. I never got a, around to doing that. Um, and then when I uh, uh, actually when I dealt with uh, Peter Lang and and we had talked about starting a media ecology book series there. Um, and uh, if, uh, the, the person there said, uh, we should give the book series a different name um, <laughs> to differentiate it. And I said, well, I have a name, Understanding Media Ecology, but I was going to use that for my book. Um, and uh, it, it was your predecessor, uh, Mary Saviger, said, uh, no, that's great. Let's use that. And I was like, oh, OK. Um, so. I thought, what am I going to call my book now? Um, so I just said, Let, let's just call it Media Ecology and you know, make it very clear. <laughs> um, but you know, as it turned out, the book that um, I would have written 20 years ago um, would not have been the same book. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of water under the bridge and also a lot of thinking uh, that went into it. It's sort of interesting. I, I, McLuhan makes the comment that teachers are great time savers. Um, and you know, it's the sense that you know, a teacher has sort of looked at a lot of, of um, things and digested it and then presents it to you so that what you're presented with in a short period of time actually took a long period of time to create 
um, and to condense down. And I think that applies even more to writing, I mean, unless you're dictating. Um, but uh, you know, in this sense, there's a lot of time behind uh, behind this. But um, in ultimately, you know, having essentially procrastinated on writing the, writing this book for twenty years, for 20 years. <laughs> um, and in that period of time, I, you know, Postman passed away, Christine Nystrom passed away, um, and so um, it, I, as I've said to some folks already. Um, I would not rest easy in my grave if I had not written this book um, and had passed away. You know that this was this was a book that I needed to do. Um, be, I mean, anything else that I do is just gravy, you know. But but this was something. If I if I had died without this book, um, my shade would be haunting oh. you right now. <laughs> yeah, I'd be dragging those chains around and and. Uh, <laughs> You know, trying to pass my spectral form through some kind of word processor, which would probably cause untold shorts and uh, <laughs> reboots and all that. So um, it, it had to be done. Um, and, and it wasn't even the book that I originally thought it was going to be because it was going to be twice as long and include more. Um, and uh, in some ways, it's a blessing to have uh, said, okay, it's going to, it's only going to be a certain amount of words, it, which is part of what we have to do with the proposal. It wound up being uh, significantly longer, but still, to get it done. Shock surprise. Yeah. <laughs> to get it done, you know, I have to say, okay, I'm not going to deal with this. I'm going to put this aside and just get to, to the core of it, um, which is, that, I mean, if that answers your question. Yeah. Or it's an it answer. It for our audience. Um, I mean, a good deal of time has passed since um, we were in the Media Ecology program, since it existed, since Neil passed away, and a great deal of change has occurred and arisen in our media world in terms of, uh, again, just to borrow Levinson's uh, phrase, in terms of new, new media, because at some point all media are new. Um, and you know, at the same time, I would remark about the fact that uh, I know it's been part of your your mission to clarify what media ecology is to all of these people who throw the term around and think that they know what it means and don't really understand it all. But um, it, it, I, I think, I guess, in these terms, if if Neil Postman, in effect, clarified. And, and made accessible to people a great deal of what McLuhan had had written in, in his probes and, and brought it sort of down to earth and made it engaging and accessible as a way of taking a step forward. And, and if Neil was our professor who, and, and I shouldn't leave out Christine, who in, indoctrinated us into the, the church of media ecology, in what ways do you think your book is moving us forward from that? Well, Neil was great, and, and those of us that knew him, I mean, we you know, have great affection for him. Um, and one thing he was not was a systematizer. I mean, that was not what he was about. Um, he uh, drew on media ecology um, and I mean he would present it in different ways um, to set up his argument uh, and you know what didn't care necessarily about about systemizing it overall or even being consistent uh, across time because his point was to address issues of public concern and he was very much a public intellectual and you know that's what he was doing um, so that left us without um, a, a real statement. I mean, there hasn't been a, a real statement of what media ecology is. Uh, Christine Nystrom, as you mentioned, her dissertation was the first attempt to do that systematically, and that's what she always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, and and in, in many ways, I mean, Chris, Christine was my Mentor. I mean, so was Neil, um, and uh, he was my model for many things. But um, in terms of scholarship, it really was more Christine. Um, she was my 
dissertation advisor. Uh, and, uh, and she was the one who really did want to, to systematize it, but never really was able to do it, at least beyond this kind of early work. Um, and, and that needed to be done. So what, what I set out to do was to try to create, a, if you like, a kind of philosophical mm -hmm. foundation and a coherent uh, statement uh, of what media ecology is about. Because what I did previously, I know my first book, Echoes and Reflections on, on Media Ecology as a Field of Study, was a, rev uh, a good part of it was a review of the literature. Uh, and at the same time, our friend Casey Lum edited an anthology on media ecology where he had different uh, contributors discuss different theorists, right. major theorists. Right. Um, and, and that had been the only really major way to present the field was, okay, there's Marshall McLuhan, here's what McLuhan said, there's Harold Innes, here's what Innes said, there's Lewis Mumford, here's what Mumford said, Jacques Ellul, and so on, Walter Ong, Neil Postman, um, and that tended to, I mean, that's, that's very good, um, it, it's very much in keeping with our approach to education, is go read these guys, right, you know, it's like, don't, we, you know, we don't have textbooks, and uh, we actually do now, because uh, Dennis Kelly um, had a book come out called Mapping Media Ecology, which also follows that pattern of these are the major theorists, here's what each one says. Um, I, I felt that a synthesis was needed. Um, I think understanding media presents a kind of synthesis. I think uh, Orality and Literacy by Walter Ong presents a kind of synthesis, although of a a part of the field, and I, and I felt a, a synthesis was needed, um, a kind of philosophical underpinning for, for this, um, and uh, you know, I was really influenced by others in, in starting to think, well, let's not, let me not present this so much as a field, but as an approach. Um, a kind of method, if you like, although method has certain connotations, but a way of understanding. And I think the idea of a way um, which, you know, in Chinese, the Tao, um, the path to follow, but, you know, and, you know that, that, is, that is the metaphor um, rather than a, um, a kind of, you know, complete canon of a uh, bo canonized body of work. Um. I don't want to steal thunder from the book and have the people who are here walk away and say, oh, great, now we don't have to read it. <laughs> but with respect to systematizing media ecology as a theoretical framework, and, and I don't think I'm asking you what is the outline of the book, what's the short course in, in like, you know, five minutes? Or, as we say, while standing on one foot. Yeah. Um, well, what, you know, part of what happened was that um, Several years ago, um, I, was, I got a, a message from uh, Bob Craig, Robert Craig, um, who was one of the editors of the, so the International Encyclopedia of Communication Theory and Philosophy, um, asking me to do a couple of entries. And one was on McLuhan, um, and one I did was on media ecology. So even though this is an online thing that where you could probably, you know, there, there need not be any fixed limit. I mean, there was a limit to the number of words. Um, I've done encyclopedia entries going way back, um, and it's a very interesting, actually, kind of exercise where you start to really take out every extraneous word you can possibly uh, think of. But, but that led me to think, well, how can I boil media ecology down, or how can I um, bring it down. I, I, I mean, I, one of the ways is to say the medium is the message, and I've done that in a lot of, of contexts, and then try to talk about what that means. Um, and, and, and that's fine, but I, I, I came down to, okay, there are four key terms. Um, and that makes up the main part of the book. Um, I mean, there's an introductory section, but then the, 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 for me, the key part is that the four key terms, each with its own chapter. One is medium. What do we mean by medium? I mean, and some of you have seen, I, I gave a, a talk 
a preliminary talk about that in a few uh, places um, la last year, including last year's uh, symposium. Uh, the second is bias. In media ecology, we talk about bias, but not the way people talk about it in, in you typically, you talk about the bias of the medium. I really went back to, well, what, what the hell does that mean? You know, where does that come from? Um, and then the third uh, is effects, with, which has always been this sort of thing that we've agonized over because, the, you know, so many people, and certainly the social sciences, behavioral sciences, you know, say, you know, you can't talk about effects, you're not being scientific, and then other people from a kind of more humanistic realms say, you're being technological, yours is technological determinism, so it's really to go back to the idea of effects um, and talk about what is it that we're, we mean by that and what, what, what have people said about the subject of effects. And, you know, some people use euphemisms like, you know, one of them is consequences. And it's like, okay, if use consequences if that makes you feel better. But, you know, you're really just saying the same thing. I, I have to say, I mean, general semantics is so much a part of this because over and over again I come down to, you know, how do we define our terms? Um, one of Postman's, you know, real emphases, you know, is what are, how do we define our terms? You know, what are the definitions that we use? What are the questions that we ask? And, you know, a question for me is an equivalent of a medium. Um, it's one part of the concept of a medium. Um, and then what are the metaphors that we use? Because, the, and that's the fourth key term, environment. Because the Postman's original definition of media ecology, the study of media as environments, a definition by metaphor. And what does that mean? You know, and, and the equation that that implies that media function as our environments. Um, so those are kind of like the four, to me, the key chapters, and that, and that would like kind of sum it up. Okay. Uh, do you want to read more or do you want to keep talking? Sure, I can. Uh, yeah, let's, let's do a little more. All right. So we can pull a selection out of the beginning of one of those chapters. Okay. Or um, all four, but I don't think we have time for that. <laughs> um, well, I brought up bias. Okay. And. Uh, medium, bias, effects, environment. Got that in your notes, right? <laughs> Is there going to be a test on this? No, no, no. no. <laughs> Just give me something to talk about on the way home. Multiple choice, though. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I start out the chapter by talking about the typical meaning of bias and then about how it's used and, and it comes up in Harold Innes and then uh, McLuhan and Edmund Carpenter pick up on it and they're talking about bias but it's never quite defined um, and uh, I do make the distinction that with the typical sense that we refer to bias um, you're referring to a cognitive bias. That, that's, you know, where we have prejudice or we're impartial in some way. Um, and, uh, and I refer to other kinds, other senses, cultural bias, communication bias, which is what Innes is really talking about. And then as opposed to media bias, which gets associated with cognitive bias, right, prejudice and so forth, medium bias as what's specific to media ecology. Um, so I wrote, uh, and this is a section of that chapter called The Nature of Bias. Critics might also find fault with McLuhan based on the fact that cognitive bias, being in the mind of the beholder, can be changed, whereas medium bias is an inherent characteristic that is beyond our ability to fundamentally alter. Their difficulty with the concept of medium bias stems from an overestimation of the freedom of action and power of human agency, as well as a lack of awareness of the root meaning of bias itself. 
I'm just going to say this is where, again, general semantics comes in and just, you know, thinking what the hell do these words really mean, right? The term's application to cognition, the term biases application to cognition, to human beliefs, attitudes, and opinions, prejudices and predispositions, etc., is in fact a metaphor, one so deeply embedded that the fact that it is a metaphor has been forgotten. The root meaning of bias is a physical one, that of a slant, a term that is synonymous with bias, but is closer to terms such as a slope, a bent, an incline, from which we get inclination, in such early usage, it also referred to the irregular shape of a ball in lawn bowling and the oblique course that it would consequently take. Additionally, in textiles, it refers to cutting across the grain. In electricity, to a method of supplying steady current or voltage, also used in conjunction with audio tape. Some of you may remember that. Um, my point is that the concept of medium bias is not an inappropriate projection of cognitive bias onto the technological environment, but rather a, re a reconnection to bias in the physical environment as a basic characteristic that influences everything within that environment. So the second law of thermodynamics can be understood as a statement about one of the fundamental biases of the universe, the statistical tendency for the amount of entropy to increase over time until reaching the final state of equilibrium via random distribution, otherwise known as the heat death of the universe. This bias results in the temporal equivalent of a slope, otherwise known as time's arrow, the idea that the overall increase in entropy is irreversible so that in contrast to the concept of absolute time in Newtonian physics, the past and the future are fundamentally asymmetrical. As a bias, the statistical tendency is not absolute, so while entropy on the whole increases within a closed system, there also are countercurrents of negative entropy, subsystems in which order and complexity increase making possible autopoiesis or self-organization. Indeed, different parts of a system that move together, move towards increased entropy in different ways, may actually complement each other in such a way that one provides what the other one needs in order to increase its order and organization. In this way, the bias towards entropy can result in a decrease of entropy locally, not for the system as a whole. The point is a bias is a tendency. Tendencies are not absolutes, but statistical probabilities. Moreover, it's interesting to know that in statistics, we measure tendencies by way of a mean, mode, or median, all terms closely related to means, method, and medium, again taking us into the middle of things. Bias in the physical world can be easily understood. Gravity is a form of physical interaction, is a phenomenon we are all familiar with, and we know it's possible to defy gravity by throwing objects upwards, and by organic and inorganic objects that float or glide, animals and machines that fly, but that gravity represents a powerful bias of our physical environment. Okay, and I think we can uh, leave it at that, but... Okay. Um, you know, the idea was to, and, and really to think about why do we use the term bias of the medium? Where does that come from? And it's actually a close, a more closer to the root meaning of bias is the physical tendency of things to move in a certain direction. You know, in the same way the bias, uh, and this goes back to Aristotle actually, you know, the bias of stone is to be hard, you might say, mm -hmm. right? Um, the bias of water is to flow, and, and that is where we talk about the bias of television in uh, Postman's uh, estimation is to be entertaining. Mm -hmm. um, and the bias of writing is towards ideas. Um, and this, this gets us back to the connection to formal cause. Yeah. Yes. Okay. 
Exactly. Which, which I think is maybe a concept that maybe we should address quickly too, because I know it's in there, and I'm not sure, sure. that everybody understands Aristotle's four clauses, nor that connection to what you're saying about bias. Well, that comes up under effects, mm -hmm. um, and it gets, um, I think, a little bit obs obscure, but and it comes from uh, Marshall and especially Eric McLuhan's work um, to connect, to, to sort of bring back Aristotelian notions of causality. Um, but it is, and it helps to speak to the accusation of technological determinism, which it goes to the problem of when we say, well, say the effects of television. What are the effects of television? Um, they are to make you stupid. <laughs> That's the, yeah, you know, the way uh, the the way Neil would put it in, in a kind of offhand moment. Um, but to, um, you know, or, or McLuhan would put the effects of literacy are to change the way we use our eyes, uh, to focus and to think more in in terms of fixed points and and that linearity that that I spoke to, um, and that when it's presented in terms of a simple cause and effect, um, it becomes difficult. It certainly becomes impossible to test scientifically, um, but it becomes problematic in, in other ways. Um, so what, what uh, Eric found in Aristotle, and, in, and it goes back to Marshall McLuhan, was that uh, the older notions that there are, many, there are several different forms of causality, and that what happens with modern science is that it's all eliminated in favor of the kind of billiard ball sense of cause and effect action reaction um, and that formal causality um, is one of the four causes there's also material cause which actually is along the lines of bias in the way that I talk about it the quality the you know the, the sense of the material itself that you're using which has certain properties which are part of the final uh, result that you get um, there is the final cause, which speaks to purpose, or at least um, uh, events that have a direction, that move in a certain direction, that may have a goal or, or again, a tendency. Mm -hmm. But formal cause is the idea that, as sort of separate from the material in the world, there are forms. Um, and this is something we see with Gregory Bateson as well, and, and some of you may have been here when we uh, had uh, Gregory Bateson's daughter, Nora Bateson, um, and we did a book uh, event for her, and she talked about it. Uh, and Bateson used the term meta patterns. <laughs> ah, thank you. Uh, I used the term meta patterns to talk about this, but that there are forms in the world, in the universe, that repeat. Uh, you know, like that, and, and mathematics is all about that, the Fibonacci sequence, right, the spirals, we find them, uh, you know, in, in subatomic physics, we find them in, in the macro world of, of astronomy. Um, the form is separate, has a separate kind of quality or separate kind of uh, existence um, from the, the um, specific materials themselves. Um, and so what I suggest is that things tend to fall into forms. Uh, I mean, that is one of the sort of tendencies of the universe is for things not to just be randomly distributed, but to fall into certain forms or patterns. Um, and that that is part of the causality that we're talking about. Um, that then relates to systems theory, um, the idea of emergence, um, which is also not cause and effect. We say you have an environment, things emerge out of the environment. It's not strictly, you know, A causes B, um, but it's a way of talking in a more complex way. Um, and Terence Deacon, who gave the Korzybski lecture uh, a couple of years ago, I, you know, who I discuss here, I mean, it talks about downward causality. The, um, the causality that comes from the environment to its parts, the way the environment affects what's in the environment, is not like one billiard ball hitting the other billiard ball, 
right? It's sort of the causality of the way the table, the billiard table affects what's going on with, with those billiard balls. So we're, um, it's a, that's what we need in order to talk about effects because, I mean, it's just ridiculous, right? We know that you get people who say, oh, you know, media are just what people do with them. Now, it's completely, you know, about people's decisions. And, 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 you know, and if you're a media ecologist, you know that's not true, right? I mean, that, first of all, we don't know what the hell we're doing. We, we throw this stuff out there, this technology out there. We don't know what's going to happen with it. We don't make decisions about it. Um, we don't, I, I, and we do on one level. I can say I'm not going to have television or I'm not going to have a cell phone, but we, don't, we can't live in a world without them. And, we, you know, sadly, we can't live in a world without nuclear weapons, but it still affects us. I don't have to ever ride in an airplane, but they're passing on uh, by overhead. I mean, it, 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 um, and, and you could say, well, collectively we can make decisions, and yeah, but um, it's very hard. <laughs> and it's very hard to say, you know, once you have a cell phone, right, it's very hard to say, give it up. Right, uh, make the decision not to have one. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and then again, you know, if you if you do like if you have a, a a group of people who do that, I mean, you could be the Amish, but you know, I mean, they we don't have like Amish nations. I mean, and and any nation. I I thought a great example. I, I bring this up really in amazing ourselves to death. But was George W. Bush? George W. Bush wanted to end stem cell research, right? And that in a way is, in a way, is this kind of like a media ecological decision? Like maybe some things shouldn't be done. Maybe some technologies shouldn't be pursued. Um, and of course, this was enormous outcry because how dare you? How can you end this? This might help, you know, people who are paralyzed to walk again, cure diseases. Um, and and apart from that, the French said, well, we're not going to do that. Right? So you can say I'm not going to do it, but someone else is going to do it. So in the end, um, th this whole thing that it's subject to human control, or that we know what we're doing, um, is, is absurd. Um, and, and along with that is the understanding of effects that I, I mean, I talk about, um, that we can't separate um, the, attap the effects that we um, intend from the ones that are unintended. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, they're just always going to be there. We just don't know what's going to happen. And we can't separate the effects that, are, that we anticipate, whether for good or bad, from ones that are unexpected. There are always going to be things that surprise us. It's just, it, it's just too much of a complex, introducing something into a complex system. And most of all is that you introduce, it's an ecological understanding. You have a system of interdependent parts. You change one thing, that's going to change something else, and that's going to change something else. And the effects, and the effects are are going to go through generations, but they're also going to interact with each other, which is why it's unexpected. Um, so, in what sense do we have control over these things? And the best we can do is to try to understand it, which was always what I mean. This is what was the point of media ecology, was the point of what Postman was trying to do, and you know, um, hopefully, again, this would be a, a step towards that, is how do we try to understand these things, uh, you know, how do we go about that? Um, which is why I just say the, uh, the last major chapter, I go over tools or different methods for trying to do these kinds of studies, um, as, for example, McLuhan's Tetrad, the Four Laws of Media, um, and uh, Postman's various formulations of questions to ask about media and, and innovation. I, I brought up formal cause originally because it smacked of what you're saying about bias, and then of course you tied it to the, the chapter on effects. Um, I also I brought it up because of the extent to which it's 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 real. We can't hear you. I'm sorry. I've been air Yes, I'll do the best I can. Um, Tough lawyers. Where was I? Um, with, with respect to, to the, the other reason that I brought up formal cause is the extent to which 
uh, you and a number of other people within the Media Ecology Association have been uh, writing about that uh, for, for quite a while. But so in, in your answers so far, we're talking about parsing or parsing out these ideas. Can we try to do a little exercise in applying them? And um, let, me, let me throw out a couple of possibilities of, of changes that have occurred since our predecessors, since, since Neil was writing. Things you started to touch upon in, in Amazing Ourselves, things you touch upon, I'll, I'll give you three, pick one. Augmented reality, artificial intelligence, virtual reality. In terms of, of bias and effects and the things that you've been saying, talking about this theoretically, can we apply that thinking to, let's talk about one of them. Well, I, I mean, I think augmented reality is an interesting topic to, to apply. And uh, uh, you know, I, I, one of the things that you know, is sort of basic to the method is to look at patterns of history and how they apply. Um, and so, I mean, what is augmented reality but putting electronic overlay onto the actual world? Um, and I think we can see that this is actually the new form of signage, you know, and that what we did was that we wrote all over the world. Um, and we, you know, when we go to, like, when we went to, when we occupied Iraq, um, and um, you know, and then our forces in ba uh, in uh, Baghdad, thank you, in Baghdad, we're, uh, we're going around looking for insurgents. Uh, one of the problems they faced is that not every uh, there were like streets, places there where streets didn't have names and houses don't have numbers. And you know, and this is so commonplace for us. Um, you know, this is what we expect, um, but this is really something that we've done, you know, that we've put signs all over the place, you know, we take it for granted, uh, another great song, signs, signs, everywhere a sign, um, but that that is, that is how we, we navigate. Um, and and uh, Edward T. Hall, another very important media ecology scholar um, from way back, uh, who wrote about culture, intercultural communication, nonverbal communication, talked about uh, the problem we had when we occupied Japan after World War II because they didn't name streets, they named blocks. Um, it's interesting. And then house numbers were based on when the house was built, not on the order, which makes sense. But, you know, again, I mean, it, it, it is these these problems that, that, that we face. So I think that, you know, to look at, at augmented reality now is the new way that we're overlaying our world, um, and in this sense, uh, creating a very, it's not just creating a media environment, but in, I mean, all of our, uh, uh, this, it's sort of interesting to take this idea of media as environment, and it allows for many different ways of, of uh, understanding it. You know, that you get lost in the medium, that we reconfigure our environment. And, and this is very clearly creating a new environment, but with the same environment seemingly there, but suddenly we have this added quality to the environment. Of course, it's a different environment here than it would have been, um, I don't know, about 10, 15 years ago, simply from the fact that probably at this moment someone there, somebody out there is looking at a cell phone, um, maybe bored and, and looking at something, or just received a text and, and wanted to check and see what tweeting. was it. Tweeting, okay. Oh. Well, that too, right? That's but, a different environment. But that's a different environment too, right? So, I mean, we're, we, and we, t we don't really think about these things, but you know, with each step, we're, we're changing our environment. So, uh, I, so again, I, mean, I think that looking at the parallels to earlier history is one kind of method. I don't know if that's quite what you're going at. I, yeah, I, I guess, you know, again, in trying to understand it and tease out you know, the biases and the effects with the, the reticence to, to specify 
you know, what are the biases of this new uh, mode of communication that we've created as this overlay? And to, to what purposes do we use it and with what effect? Mm -hmm. To borrow from Laswell. So I, I guess that's, I mean, you've answered the question, but I was, yeah. I was kind of pushing a little bit in that direction too. I don't know if you want to say any more. Well, I, you know, I think. Sorry, I don't know if I said that loud. Yeah. Well, what are the biases? Uh, I mean, I, I think, you know, one of the, the biases that's interesting about this, um, you know, McLuhan talked about sensory biases and the difference between acoust the acoustic and the visual, um, that the acoustic, you know, world or the, the kind of acoustic space we're at the center of because sound surrounds us from all directions, where visual space we're sort of on the outside looking in, especially as it's shaped by literacy and, and we look at the world in a fixed point of view. Um, and uh, I think of related to augmented reality is uh, mapping and GPS, which is a form of augmented reality. Sure. And when we used to look at maps, we were always outside of the world yeah, looking at the map. So we always had, you are here, but we were never here, right? I'm here. Um, and that was part of the problem is that, well, where am I exactly, right? But with GPS, we're back in acoustic space in that sense because we're inside of the map and we're at the center of it, right? And, 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 and so it's a, it's a very different... It's still not the territory. And it's never the territory, but it's a different relationship I mean, and that's that, that's very significant um, I mean on the one hand it's a lot easier it's simpler to navigate you don't have to read in, the, in that way you just follow directions on the other hand you lose sight of the big picture mm -hmm. you don't have that objective distanced viewpoint mm -hmm. um, so that the bias is neither good nor bad but has advantages and, and disadvantages. I, I was in a, a car the other day uh, that a friend had where, you know, you've got your GPS screen now in so many late model cars and it's right there where your, your radio used to be. Um, but of course that's dangerous because you're supposed to be looking at the road, not at the screen, oh, let me look at my directions. And, and of course, you know, we did this for years with maps where we took out the map and we're you know, <laughs> trying to try while there's papers unfolded in front of us. His car has his GPS in the windshield, but it's not in the windshield per se. It's a system of mirrors where it projects as though it, it looks like it's about two feet out beyond the windshield on the uh, front of the car. That's scary. Um, what kind well, of car is this? <laughs> uh, a BMW. BMW. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, um, just Can it help in, his in, driving? I'm sorry? Did it help his driving, or her? Oh, he's a good driver. <laughs> I don't think it hurt his driving. Him. But uh, but again, this is an example of the technology, which I think is a much more interesting one than people uh, drawing cat's ears and whiskers on their faces when they post their pictures on Instagram. Um, um, but that's open to reality too. Uh, in, in the essence of time, can we do one more reading? And sure. Then, you know, I, I actually have one more question, but then I want to open it up to everybody else. Okay. Um, well, I, um, one of the things that uh, in the chapter on environment, uh, one of the things I, I talk about is three different kinds of logics, um, one being a monologic or which is also a technologic, um, another being a dialogic, and a third being an ecologic. <laughs> so I'm trying to get towards a media ecologic, so to speak. Um, and uh, <clears throat> this, I think, is particularly appropriate uh, for New York society. Um, Clearly, dialogic and ecologic have much in common with substantial areas of overlap, both being quite distinct from monologic and technologic. In many ways, dialogic is merely a simplified form of ecologic, one that we may turn to because the complexity of ecologic renders it less accessible 
more challenging to work with and fully comprehend. As we move away from monologic, we move into the non-Aristotelian mode of thought described by Alfred Korzybski, and it is therefore worth noting his three non-Aristotelian principles of thought, non-identity, non-allness, and self-reflexiveness. The first serves as a reminder that there are no identity relationships in the biophysical environment, only in the abstract realm of the symbolic. We do, however, attempt to replicate our symbolic environment through our technological environment, through various forms of mass production, such as the mechanical clock's division of time into identical units, and the manufacture of multiple identical copies of the same text via the printing press. Non-identity also serves as a reminder not to reify our representations or to mistake them for whatever it is in reality, if anything, that they are said to represent. Example, words are not the things they represent. The map is not the territory. Not allness serves as a reminder of what Goodell referred to as incompleteness and Heisenberg as uncertainty that our perceptions and representations of reality will always be indirect and only account for a selection of what is out there. And self-reflexiveness reminds us that symbols work on different levels or reflect different logical types so that you can have statements about the world and also statements about statements, statements about statements about statements, <laughs> etc. Self-reflexiveness and communication takes us further away from a connection to concrete reality, but also makes us more aware of the fact of representation, that we are dealing in maps rather than territories they depict, and especially more aware of our mediations, of the part we play as mediators, communicators, and receivers of information from our environment. Kuzipski's system is an attempt to help individuals to break free of monologic, which is based on the influence of Aristotle's philosophy, but more basically on the effects of literacy. As for a more positive set of qualities regarding ecologic, the following list is taken from Fritjof Capra's Turning Point and Web of Life, two books on integrative rather than self-assertive, eco-action rather than ego-action, intuitive rather than rational thinking, synthesis rather than analysis, holistic rather than reductionist thinking, nonlinear rather than linear thinking, conservation rather than expansion, cooperation rather than competition, quality rather than quantity, partnership rather than domination, responsive rather than aggressive, contractive rather than demanding, feminine rather than masculine, yin rather than yang, Dionysian rather than Apol Apollon Apol Apollonian, and right brain rather than left brain. The last two pairs are my own additions rather than ones that Capra included, but no doubt quite a few others could be added as well. And so I go on, I um, just want to note, because uh, Capra also refers to basic principles of ecology, interdependence, recycling, partnership, flexibility, diversity, and sustainability. And uh, I add two more to that, which is balance, which is, I think, the fundamental kind of um, goal of media ecology, and mediating, which uh, one of the things I didn't get to, but um, one of the things I also argue is that when we talk about medium and medium, what we're really talking about is a process of mediating, which I get, for, again, to give credit to general semantics, and Korzybski is following uh, the idea of a process of abstracting which is what we do when we perceive and use symbols. What we're talking about, what a medium is, is a process of mediating. So, 
Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. that's, thank you. Sure. Um, I get, uh, to finish up, unless you do want to read more, uh, our uh, part of the show, sure. before we go to questions, I, I did have two less questions that I had thought of before I got here. And, and, and one is just um, to, to sum it up, if, if there's a takeaway from tonight's session, um, and, and effectively a sales pitch for the book, um, what $40. Is, yeah. <laughs> what is the, the one most important takeaway that you would hope that the reader would get from reading this book? Oh boy. <laughs> so my job is to ask the questions and put him oh on the God. spot. <laughs> well, I, I hope that they get that uh, you know the that importance of media ecology, you know, that they come away with an understanding of, of what it is about, um, and that it um, is the beginning of something more. Um, the worst thing that, about it would be if it's the end of it all. <laughs> um, the last word, I mean, that would be an abject failure, but um, you know, if it is the beginning of going forth and studying and, and reading more, because um, there's always more to read, but reading more and finding those connections, that everything is connected. I think that, I mean, maybe that is, you know, that, that there is a connection to be made, you know, that we live in a world that seems to be made up of separate things and separate fields. I was telling, to, talking to my students about, you know, ha, about this, and again, this is something Bates and among others talked about. That 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 you get this impression that there is a separate field called psychology and a separate field called history, and it's not true. Not in reality, you know, that all these things are are interconnected, um, and that, but they're not all equal. That the things that are that create the connections are what's really significant, and that's what we're talking about. The medium uh, is the connecting, the connective tissue uh, that binds it all together. So that's why we need to particularly pay attention to that. Um, that actually segues, I guess, into my last question, which is, um, you know, I thought when, that was your last. No, question. no, no. I said I have to. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, when the media ecology program at NYU closed it down its doors, um, we created this virtual house for it by creating the Media Ecology Association. And you, of course, served as its president for 10 years. Um, and now you've written the book again, where on the cover in you know, bold letters is, is a term that shows up in passing in a lot of places, maybe in a subtitle here and there. But, you know, in a sense, uh, you're the, the center for us to continue the tradition of media ecology. Um, and, and with respect to, to continuing to bring life to these ideas and to continue that conversation, uh, we need others. Who else is helping? Who else do you think is out there not leaving it all to you? And to your book or to your books? You? <laughs> <laughs> okay, besides me, thank you. Um, well, I, I mean, we have our, uh, certainly our community, in, you know, in terms of the uh, uh, Media Ecology Association, and, and which again, I mean, there's a very interesting overlap with, with the general semantics, uh, so it includes Corey Anton and Ed Tawaniak, um, and uh, you know the uh, and uh, your colleague who is very kindly uh, videoing us now, uh, Mike Kluf, um, Dina Karasik over there, and there's you know Sal Falica, Paul Lipper, Bob Albrecht. Bob, are you still here? Hey, Bob. I uh, I you know the, we've uh, you know you kind of. Putting me on the spot on that in that score because we, um, I'm, I'm going to be leaving out so many people that. Well, again, uh, I wasn't looking. I could, for you I could go back to the acknowledgements and read them. Uh, <laughs> you know, Paul Sukup, and you know, you could certainly, um, you know, certainly in terms of significance of the 
to general semantics I mean, component, Marty, Marty Levinson's contributions uh, to that. Uh, I mean, you know. The, I just want to make sure that we tell people, people in this room, who yeah. are the other people who are doing great and important work, so that again, it's not, you know, I mean, tonight it's all about you, but hopefully it's not all about you. That's a hell of a lot of weight to carry on one's shoulders. Well, I, I, I certainly hope not, yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I mentioned uh, you know some of the work that's come out, and uh, just to note, I mean, in the in the book series, I mean, there are four books in this new series now. Uh, um, one of them is Dennis Kelly's uh, attempt at doing a, a textbook, a real textbook for media ecology. Um, a couple of books are produced by Robert Logan. Uh, one of them. Um, goes back a ways and then is brought up to date about uh, a project he did with Marshall McLuhan on the, the future of the library. Another is the new edition of his Understanding New Media. You mentioned Paul Levinson, of course. I say Paul Sukup, I mean, in MEA. Um, and uh, uh, some of the fo other folks, Paul Grossweiler, who's the uh, outgoing editor of uh, Explorations in Media Ecology. Um, and and uh, very exciting, you know, some of the great young graduate students who are uh, coming out of uh, programs like over at Duquesne. We've seen a bunch, uh, University yeah, of yeah, Pittsburgh yeah. too. Um, and, uh, you know, then, uh, you know, quite a few others. Um, I, I know we have a friend of Phil Rose here. Um, where is he? There he is, right? Um, from Canada, I mean, we, uh, again, the question wasn't to, to make yeah. you worry about who you're leaving out. The question was to make but sure you made me worry. Uh, <laughs> I'm okay, sorry, whoever I didn't mention. I'm yeah, sorry, so whoever I forgot. I'm sorry, I wouldn't put me on the spot. Um, well, well, thanks. Uh, do you, is there anything else you wanted to read before we open it up to questions? No, no, I think we, um, you know, if there are a couple of questions, but we also want to leave time for more wine and uh, sure. and also for some anyone who wants to buy a book $40 oh, yes we have to yeah. Yeah. <laughs> save time for that uh, so okay let's let's say we have what well do 10 we, minutes of questions well let's see if we have any if uh, we have there's a hand uh, you said that the ecology and the point of it is balance um, and in a world where uh, there are a lot of kids growing up who I think have a decent sense not of all media, of course, but what the bias of certain uh, media, as we're saying, Twitter and Snapchat are their own sort of environments, what each of those environments do. Um, that I would never send this in an email, that would be a text, or this would never be a text, that would be a Snapchat, you know. Um, when we have sort of this generation coming up with actually perhaps a good sense of what each media does bias, what do you think balance looks like or means? Well, that, that really is the question, and, and it's, what's very clear is what imbalance looks like, because we're, we're constantly there, and each introduction of a new medium or a new, a new gadget uh, creates a, a more imbalance, a further imbalance. Um, so I think, uh, I think one common theme is language, and uh, that part of the imbalance is moving too far into both uh, a, a predominance of image-based media and also a kind of incoherence in language. And, and I won't mention Donald Trump um, tonight <laughs> because I'm sick of it, but uh, you. you know, when we think, you know, the words incoherent language, um, I think we all know what we're talking about. and. Um, uh, so I think that you know the these way back to balance is in terms of speech, dialogue, people actually conversation. Sherry Turkle's wonderful book, Reclaiming Conversation, is so much a part of that. Um, and reading um, is so much a part of that. Emily, of course, theater is a product of speech and literacy and the wonderful sort of hybrid energy, to use McLuhan's phrase, that, that comes out of the combination of two, reading out loud poetry, um, as Adina so excels at. Um, the 
and reading, uh, and it, one of the most encouraging things is, is at least reading, and I hope it's true, that millennials, that young people actually have turned away from reading on screens, reading on Kindles and such, and are choosing to read on paper. Wow. Um, and, and that's really, I, I think that's really good. I think that's really important. Um, writing as well, using your hand. There is something about the hand, mm -hmm. hand-eye, that is lost when we, we type and, at a screen. Um, and I think that that's, you know, again, studies show that students who, who take notes by, with pen and paper retain much better than students who sit there with laptops. Um, I think that's, that, that, that's all part of reclaiming some balance. Thank you. And so on that note, uh, as you said of television, does all technology make us stupid? No. <laughs> no. What is some technology that makes us smarter? Books. Uh, now come on, Robin, you know the answer to that. I'm talking about new and, technology. And, and, but, uh, I, 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 I was being, you know, joking around with that, and, and I think, you know, I think even Neil was to, to some extent, um, because, you know, I think he would say that, for example, if you're a baseball player, then television can help you make, be a better baseball player, because you can really see up close, so, you know, say how pitchers and batters are, are working, um, and so it does come down to the question, what is appropriate for a given medium, what is the appropriate use, and that, and that's that's really the problem is that we don't, you know, once we get this new medium, we don't just say this is what it's good for. We just say this. Let's use it for everything, uh, and lose sight of, of that. So that that that's really the the key. Yes. Oh, there's there's something lacking in people to people interaction, person to person interaction with all this media. And that's what I, I, I worry about that. Yes, well, we all do. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, and you know, I mean, again, it, it, this is where we need the historical context because, um, you know, in an interesting way, when we started to talk about electronic, uh, computer mediated communication going back to email, uh, it, it all depended on the context you looked at. So if you compared it to conversation, to face-to-face -to -face communication, it seemed like we were losing something. But when we compared it to print media, it seemed like we were gaining an interactivity. Um, and different people argued from, from one or the other perspective. Um, and so we need to, to see it in this more holistic way and that it has advantages and disadvantages. Um, but uh, I, I mean, I, I do agree with you. I mean, that's what's wonderful about this. I and mean, we try to do the best of, bo of both worlds here. So, you know, we get together face to face to talk and listen and have different people come and talk. I, this is something we've been doing uh, before there was writing. So before history, this is something that's been happening. Um, but we also record it on video and put it up there so that other people can see it. Um, it's not It's not the same. You'd really be much better. I'm talking now to our home audience. You would be much better off if you were here, present with us. Um, but uh, this way it's not something that's lost in the moment. It's, there's some something of it is preserved for better or for worse. Um, that Archiving arguably is an appropriate use. If it's if you don't say, well, I'm not going to come because I'll watch the video, that would be bad. But <laughs> if it's that you can't come because you're not local or or otherwise unable to come, then um, it's uh, at least some record of what what went on. And someone can see it and look you up and contact you later. And that's true, and or it can be very embarrassing uh, for my children or uh, whatever. Well, on that note, I, I think it's time again to uh, sign some books. I would like to thank you all so much for coming, and, and I would like to thank. You.